Hello and welcome to Audiovisual Cultures. I'm your host Paula Blair. In this episode, Andrew Shale and I return to our viewings of Sofia Coppola's films, this time looking at her feature debut, The Virgin Suicides. Before settling into that, a reminder that you can get in touch via email on audiovisualcultures at gmail.com with queries or if you'd like to be a guest speaker. I'm all about breaking down boundaries and disrupting hard borders, so I hope you'll join me for that and I hope you enjoy the following discussion. So Dr. Blair, what did we just watch? We've watched the third in our Sophia Coppola Season. sporadic marathon. <laughs> and then the marathon will continue. Yeah because I think we've sort of made a pact now to try and watch all of her feature films and because it's the only way we know how we're doing them in arse about face order. <laughs> Second, yeah. most recent, first, <laughs> so far as how we've gone. We've just watched The Virgin Suicides, which was Sofia Coppola's feature debut, released in, well, in the US in 99, pretty much everywhere else, 2000. Released in festivals in 99 okay. and general release in 2000. There's probably quite a lot to get to. I just want to chip in first and say I think it was really fascinating to watch it for the first time after seeing The Beguiled because mm-hmm. you see all the things that are going to come back again in The Beguiled. So there's probably going to be quite a lot of discussion points from our previous episode on that film that we can uh, tease out a bit more. The issue that arises here is do we now have a revision to our reading of The Beguiled given that the pattern that seems to be emerging here is of not an implication that the women are morally reprehensible that they're culpable for suffering but just a refusal on the part of the film to tell you what's going on in the heads of the young women so it's actually what we took in the regard for the film refusing to sympathise with the characters the film designating the characters as having some responsibility for things that go wrong maybe what we took for that was actually just the film refusing to tell us refusing to let us into the privacy of girls that at least seemed to be a stronger message in this film now I suppose we've got to cover some basics there's no specific date that it's set in. It's simply the text at the beginning is Michigan 25 years ago. Mm-hmm. So roughly 1975. And as we were watching it, I looked up the release dates of some of the pieces of music that were heard in the story space, mm-hmm. and they were released in 1975. It's not necessarily the case that these pieces of music would have been very recently released pieces of music that they were listening to at the mm-hmm. homecoming dance. But if it wasn't 75, it would have been 76. This would have been when Sophia Coppola herself was either four or five years old. So it's not something she seems to be drawn to on the basis of it having been when she was a teenager. Mm. I initially went, oh, this is quite personal. This is her being drawn to her Mm. own period when she was a teenager. But no, I got that completely wrong. She was only born in 1971. So, of course, it's an adaptation of a novel by Geoffrey Eugenides, which was published in 1993. And I suppose appropriately, that was Eugenides' debut novel and this was Sophia Coppola's debut feature film. I had to check whether it was because I thought, wow, do you get James Woods, Kathleen Turner, Danny DeVito? You do if you've got a certain father. (laughs) And I suppose Sophia Coppola, to her own credit, had been an actress yeah, she's been a, she's this. been around, and I think she'd made shorts. She wasn't an unknown by any means. Yeah. And also, there's Scott Glenn as well, who was recognisable from a few things. He played Father Moody. So there's four not A-list stars, but recognisable stars. I I, I would count Kirsten Dunst in there as well already because hmm. she was a child actress. She's really well established. She was in Interview with a Vampire and Little Women earlier in the nineties. Certainly to me, I was in my mid-teens when Virgin Suicides came out so that's partly why it passed me by but I was very aware even at that age of Kirsten Dunst because of the role she'd already had as a child and then of course she hits it pretty big you know a year or two after this with Spider-Man. I'm looking at her filmography right now and she was uh, actually notable, she was the voice of Kiki in the English version yes, it, of yes, Kiki's that's delivery service. But she'd done one, two, three, four, five Five. Oh, she was in Jumanji. Six. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Seven, eight, nine. Yeah, this was by no means. Uh-huh. Kind of She's already a better enough actress at that point, and I was very aware of who she was when I was that age. We tend to associate certain directors with certain performers, mm-hmm. but that tends to oversimplify things. So, of course, yeah. there is a pre Coppola dance. I think this is the beginning of a relationship with Coppola. And on that note, the voice of the narrator was very familiar. I thought that we were going to get to meet them. 
the narrator later on in the film, but no, we just didn't. So I looked it up, and it was Giovanni Ribisi. You had looked that up before mm-hmm. when we were watching Lost in Translation. It's not even clear which of those four boys is the narrator. It seems like it might be the taller one, mm. and I'm pretty sure that we don't actually get the names of these boys. No, I um, don't think so. Not those four. Because they hadn't been named, I found myself, when we later spent a bit of time with an older set of boys, mm-hmm. found myself going, hang on, have we met any of these boys before? Who? It was hard to tell yeah. who's who. There was a kind of swarm characteristic to the boys in this film. But I think that's the point, probably, is yeah. it's just boys and it's just girls. And yeah. at that age, I'm sure, it's all the same. You're just putting in an, an obsession from burgeoning sexuality. You're just giving it a name, just giving it a focal point at that age. That was particularly dramatised when Trip Fontaine, the one played by mm-hmm. Joss Hartnett, manages to get Mr Lisbon, the father played by James Woods, to agree to let him and three other unspecified boys mm. take Lux and the other three daughters in unspecified pairings to the homecoming dance and it's only really decided when they arrive who's mm. going to take who when they arrive with their corsages <laughs> it's really American thing of mm. going you have to bring a corsage for your date everything's white yeah it's so white mm. so mm. a spot of shady nerd business to kick <laughs> us off there was virtually no camera movement in this film. One of the things that was notable about Lost in Translation was rather well, floaty camera movement, but it was still quite restricted and there was still it still seemed to be outweighed by the number of shots with no movement. This film was very big on the no movement, or if it was movement, it would be movement such as one might see if the camera was doing a point of view shot from out of a car. So the movement would occur when it was being moved by a subject yeah, that the camera was the attached camera to. The camera is static. Yeah. It's stuck on someone's head, mm-hmm. but it's static. Colour. Colour was just a really strong aspect of what was going on in this film. And it wasn't mise en well, it wasn't colour of story space objects. It was filters. Consistent use of mm-hmm. filters. Slightly different versions of each shade. So sometimes it would be a bit more orange, sometimes a bit more yellow. But there was scenes which would be shot with this yellowy orange mm. filter. For that vivid <clears throat> green at the end. Well, that was the thing. is Given that the pattern that we've had so far, which was switching between mm. those yellow and orange filter shots and then quite washed out blue filtered shots, shots I was doing a tally I counted at least nine instances when we'd switch from yellowy orange to whitey blue or vice versa in a straight edit so that it would be quite an abrupt visual contrast so that's high graphic contrast um, edits there and then suddenly after a pattern of this wafting back and forth between these two colors then suddenly after the suicides we get introduced to this scene where there's this sickly green yeah it's a vomity green and it's associated with a bit of pointless story about algae breeding in a local lake emitting quite a foul smell around the town so we get to see the smell so copper's thing at this point seems to be a determination to use filters to help us see what's in the air what's not visible including things like smells and emotion there's all these references i think the boys are trying to figure out the ineffectual coping mechanisms that the community tries to employ that the parents initially try to employ when cecilia the youngest girl commits suicide should we say commit suicide or or is it better to say kill yourself? Well, if we say commit, that's a verb attached to a crime. Mm, it's yeah. problematic, isn't it? And it's the, just a force of habit to say it because it's that conculation, yeah. isn't it? That's and it's cool. a way of not saying kill yourself. That side suffix also implies a crime. There's regicide and fratricide and matricide. Uh-huh. And, everything. and these all imply a kind of hierarchy of crimes mm. like um, infanticide is worse than regicide or so on. Yes, we ought to just call a spade a spade and refer to it as the characters killing themselves. I think that maybe it raises issues about the right to die there's a right to life but there's a right to die as well and if your life's been made not worth living for various reasons <clears> I think that would probably bring us on to the issue of transgression so that's probably quite a big thing that we can come back to yes this might be a time for me to plant the little flag that says the film didn't make abundantly clear the extent of these girls suffering because it's not seen through any of their points of view it's all yeah. seen through the frame of the boys who are trying to understand and who can't get access so it's that inaccessibility well maybe that's the thing it's because it's an adaptation and it's clearly an adaptation which adopts the narrative voice of the novel which clearly seems to have been a first person narrative voice the film seems to go okay we're going to do a filmic version of first person narrative voice even though the default narrative voice of film is utterly impersonal nearly omniscient 
third person narrative voice. And so while it was very clear, because there was lots of voiceover of one of the male characters from up in the late 90s recalling all this stuff back in the mid-70s, even though it was very clear that we were getting focalised narration, that was contrasting with the fact that a lot of the time we were getting a camera which would go into these girls' bedrooms and would show you very close details of faces and expressions but I suppose looking back on it yeah if one is aware that this is all supposed to be through the eyes of some boys a lot of these instances where we're seeing very close shots of expressions of these girls they were of course all point of view shots of our boy onlooker characters now it makes it I think given the time of the setting of the film and I I noticed quite a lot not just with the sisters who are the focus of the film but girls in general in the film it's almost they're performing to be looked at so I was thinking about because of the time of the film setting which is roughly 1975 that was when Laura Mulvey's seminal film feminist essay was published, Visual Pleasure in uh, Narrative Cinema she's starting to explore those issues around the to be looked atness of actresses on screen and I wonder how much Coppola Certainly, you could do a textbook reading of the film, but you you applying that theory and advances to it because there's so many of the girls. I was noticing at the dance, there's a lot of the girls, the background actresses, just standing around, looking around, expecting somebody to be looking at them. And nobody is except the camera, except the film's point of view. No one else is looking at them, but everybody's looking at those four sisters at some point or Mm. trying to. This constant performance of them being being looked at because I guess they are I mean they're the four sisters who are left they're being dissected Mm. by these four boys who become men and who are trying to understand what happened and they can't they have no access to it but they're being dissected and they're being looked at in memory going through Cecilia's diary which helps them learn more about their internal lives and the wildness of their internal lives I suppose we were given plenty of clues weren't we like when they go into the diary one of the boys goes they're all kind of snatching it from each other and reading mm-hmm. bits out and one of the boys goes jeez how many pages can you write about a dying tree and flicks past them and tries to find something more juicy mm-hmm. and does but of course the fact that this tree is dying does seem to be something all of the girls are quite concerned yeah. about and they come out to protest it being cut down and they're only scared away from it by the arrival of a news the van camera, yes they're being looked at by the eyes yeah. of the United States of America because of what their sister did and the way that they just leave the instant the news mm-hmm. van arrives is quite a the gift stern tree protest. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's at the cost of the tree. You will not use our image. And the tree seems to be a reference to a plot element in To Kill a Mockingbird as well, because mm. the character who communicates with the kids just by leaving them little toy figurines inside the hole in a tree, who's called Bo Radley. Mm. Bo Radley. That active communication between these distant characters is cut off when the father and Bo's father notices that it's happening and then cements up the hole in the tree. So there seems to be a reference there to Mm. an older generation interfering with what a younger generation does. I suppose restricted narration is something which I hadn't paid enough attention to. It was quite evident in quite a few places, but I was looking for the old film just tell us what these girls are thinking. It doesn't have to. But it doesn't have to. But that's the whole point, is a teenage girl isn't going to tell you what she's thinking. Why should she? And the whole point is their transgressive behaviour, even when it's only internal, because that's the only place where these five kids can be free. They live in such a repressive household. The film did show us some elements of the way in which the mum was repressive. The first way that it showed us, well the first moment when it showed us was, it showed us in quite a few ways, but one of the more evident moments was when Lux arrives back the morning after the homecoming dance and the camera remains roughly at about the street distance from the house. So it remains 12 metres at least from the front door, so everything's done in quite a distant long shot and the point of audition remains that distance away as well and so when Lux opens the front door to her own house and her parents arrive, the dad doesn't seem to say a word but he just seems to be both shocked and glad that she's there yeah. and then the mum gets quite violently angry mm-hmm. at it. It's one of those instances where it's quite clear what sort of household they're living in and then the other one is when the mum forces 
likes to burn her mm. rock vinyl. And there's a particular protest about Aerosmith. So I wonder if the narration is subjective. Is that a projection onto the mother? Mm-hmm. Or is that really, you know, I think it's ambiguous enough that it's not clear whether that was really how the mother was. Or if this is this guy trying to psychologise out an answer to why they did it, to why they all killed themselves. So do you think that that might have been in a scene as it, because it was inside their house? Well, something that one of the boys wouldn't have been able to see. So yeah, because there's quite a lot of that. And then, then when the other guys pick them up for the dance, I mean, that's four completely different boys. It doesn't include the four that are trying to help them. They're filling in gaps. I think the voiceover refers to that, that the attempts to fill in gaps and how subjective and they have to be quite creative in filling in the gaps. This must have happened. They're speculating all the time. Okay. So I wonder how much do we trust what we even see? Is it too simple to say that their mother's that repressive and there's a toxic femininity as well as a toxic masculinity coming through? Well, the film does seem to make it quite evident that the mum is a repressive parent because she's a devout Christian. A devout Catholic yeah. specifically. Oh, of course, yeah, all the Virgin Mary business, yeah, it's all over the place. And the cross is with Jesus on them as well, yeah. As far as the narrator's concerned, it's when she comes back from a particularly anti-popular culture sermon that she mm-hmm. insists that Lux burns her, the re- her rock, the rock records. Um, I suppose what this brings me to is a question about if this is something that's very easy to do in prose, because prose is automatically suggestive of subjectivity because it's a speech act, is that something which film has a problem doing? Because film being a set made up of a set of views of the world doesn't come with that automatic evocation of subjectivity. It comes with something very different. It comes with a default evocation of objectivity. Does that mean that if you want to do a film which you're suggesting that everything you're seeing is subjective, it's all being recollected from a lot later and it's all going through characters other than our protagonists who were alive at the time, does that mean you have to pack in so many very clear signposts saying this is subjective that if you happen to miss, leave out 10% of those signposts, the whole message doesn't work. Objectivity and default objectivity burns through what you're trying to do with the film. But I suppose looking back at it, a lot of it does make a lot more sense, assuming that objective default has been replaced by a subjective one. I just wonder if the film's got enough in it to indicate that that objective default is to be set aside and we're supposed to perceive subjectivity throughout. Although my list of ways in which this speaks of, what would it be, craftspersonship? It does also suggest the way that it speaks of subjectivity. So what I list? I wrote technically proficient, colon, handwritten on-screen text, voiceover, bits of the narrative provided pre-main titles, freeze frames, transparency of one shot over another, conspicuously unusual angles, such as the high angle shot of the two women talking in the house, very near the beginning, very brief shots with scenes cutting off quite abruptly midway through so that we're jumping forward to the next scene, lots of silence, several instances of uncertainty about when things are happening relative to each other because there's some reordering. So for example, when Lux wakes up on the football field after the homecoming dance, Trip Fontaine is just gone. The guy who she was who she fell asleep next to during the night he's just gone and then in a couple of shots later we see the moment when he gets up during the night and leaves her on her own so a bit of temporal reorganizing lots of snippets of larger conversations so that we're getting very partial views of things use of split screens having a bit of voiceover from the girl's diary while the boys are reading it so it's a spoken version of a written account that's being recalled by the person who's narrating the films and multiple levels of people narrating their lives flicking to the people talking in the present in 1990 ish because we see the older version of Joss Hartnett's character Trip in 1999. Having rather large sound bridges, using fast motion, the opposite of slow motion. So the first time that Lux kisses Trip Fontaine, it happens in this kind of slightly Benny Hill. It's always a bit funny, fast motion. Slightly Benny Hill speed. Time lapses, such as watching the decay of their front garden. Selective overexposure, staging in depth. Having cameras that don't follow people around and just stay off at a distance, so non-omnipresent cameras. The slideshow of the imagined photos of them all travelling around Europe. Pack them together, I suppose the purpose of all these things is to suggest contrivance at the level of the film's narration. So, of course, that contrivance is mm-hmm. the contrivance of a narrator. It's, it? it's the gaps they're trying narrator. to fill in. They're trying to yeah. figure out the past. And there was, of course, that one moment when we're seeing that imagined slideshow of photos mm-hmm. of the characters going on this imagined journey. And the very last slideshow is just a white 
image on a screen. So we do get a bit of it's blank blankness, page yeah. um, in this film. There's plenty of evocations of it being a text recalled by a character, a text contrived by a character in the story space. Just ones that I was completely blind to at the mm-hmm. time, obviously. I suppose a couple of things about camera work in general that you've brought up. The lack of camera movement is notable because a lot of what's going on in this film is girls lying around in rooms. So the cameras aren't moving because they're not moving. It's very still. I'm pretty sure I've read somewhere Sofia Coppola talking about that in this film actually is that experience of the teenage girl just lounging around for hours on end in a room doing nothing but maybe having a very vivid time in her head but from the outside looking like she'll be completely idle so having been a teenage girl that's something I can relate to where you're off on adventures in your head in crazy worlds and really exciting things are happening when you feel confined in a room and you're not moving and you're stagnant you you feel stagnant and that but you're also idling and you're winding around it's part of the teen girl experience somehow that tension between the vivid and what looks like very boring nothingness but actually it's the internal world the internal experience the internal life that's really vivid and really sexually charged often as well so there's all this tension within the stillness there's a lot of movement hidden in it I would say that that's probably what the camera's doing there and it's stillness it's reflecting a lot of that and I think you were mentioning high angle shots but there there were some fairly low angle shots as well or maybe at least the camera is not necessarily tilted but it's getting ceilings in the frame I said high angle I meant low angle (laughs) but there are high angle ones because there's the football fields there are a lot of shots looking down as well so there's a variety it's just I noticed quite a lot of these where the camera is I don't think it's tilted up but it's positioned low so that you were talking about the women who are in frame in a two shot but they're only in the bottom third of the frame and actually the rest of it is the wall and the ceiling and and the lead fittings and the yeah yeah, the chandelier and of course one of the women is making a jibe about the decor of uh, the Lisbon's house and hers is so garish and there was a lot of that 70s garishness you know and it's maybe the colours are quite washed out but the patterns are really garish so that showing of the ceilings which is kind of harking back to earlier pioneering filmmakers in an independent sense in the United States of people like Orson Welles you know in the studio era Mm -hmm. showing ceilings everywhere because you don't do that because there's no ceilings it's a set you know (laughs) so she's showing off the ceilings and I don't know if it's a deliberate hark back to that but I don't know I just felt like it was a cine and culture literate film it knows its place very much and the boys those four boys that you follow and I don't know any of their names they're always on the periphery of everything so if it's from their point of view or one of their points of view it's from a peripheral place and there's a lot of peripheral and transitional spaces being utilised in the film there's lots of thresholds windows stairways windows and doors all that kind of thing there's alleyways Rooftops. I even thought at one point when they, there was a really early on in the film a bit of narration about a little boy character whose name I forget who jumped off what we would call a first story in the US would be called a second story window ledge. The narrator at that point said he jumped off the roof of the house and he mm. didn't. He didn't jump off the roof of the house. I yeah. suppose that's, that's something implying the subjectivity of There's the, the tension narration. between memory and that and then it's mm. is the film then saying I'm the real thing mm. and his is misremembered you could probably hunt through the film and find evidence for either or I do wonder if we're in this classic adaptation situation of if you had read the book some things would make a lot more sense in this film as if it's too indebted to the book it's to a small extent at least an illustration of a book rather than a standalone narrative and the fact that it's using the implication of flawed memory from the book but iterating that in two ways the first way being that the narrator is mistaken and the second way being that the camera is mistaken Mm -hmm. does suggest an incomplete task of taking this thing and making it into a complete standalone film but hey it happens when you're adapting something that's a very Mm -hmm. tricky thing to do Mm -hmm. and also it's her first feature and I do wonder when you're doing your first feature do you get your first feature because you're already an actress the production company is your dad and also because you've agreed to adapt something which is already quite successful Mm -hmm. 
you kind of you've put your package together already, and the fact that you're a junior director who's directed only a few shorts before is seen as something that's not a particular risk, in part because of all these other production values, mm-hmm. and in part because somebody guarantees that if you're not up to it, that they'll step in and take over directing, which does tend to happen. And also, I mean, I would say a lot of the actors on set, especially the veteran actors, I would say they know she grew up on her dad's film sets, yeah. so she's got this, yeah. and I'm pretty sure there's photographs of him visiting her sets. Francis Ford's presence hovers a little bit, but it's her own. I think it's yeah, her absolutely. own distinctively as well. I was wondering, in terms of being Sunny Litter, because I don't know if it's me being really obvious or it's the film being really obvious in a lot of these allusions to things, but I was wondering if the film could be considered as a response to Stand By Me. It's been a while since mm. I've seen Stand By Me. Isn't that the one about the boys who go on a massive adventure? Yeah, and they find a dead body. Right. And it's about boyhood and friendship, friendship yeah. among boys, and it's adapted from the Stephen King. And it's got one of those endings in which the narrator explains what happened to everyone mm. in later years, and yeah. some elements is quite tragic. And as wonderful and poignant that film is, it all feels fairly wrapped up from what I remember. It's been years since I've seen it, but then I was wondering if this is a response, because it's all still a complete mystery by the mm. end of the film. You don't really, I mean, you feel like you kind of know what happened, but then it puts enough doubt in your mind that you really don't because on the surface of it five sisters kill themselves there's a lot of finger pointing at the parents and then there's a lot of ignoring of the trauma by the community around them there's no support there's no offer of support they can't cope with it it's too much five suicides is too much to deal with and they sort of write it off it's almost preceding the snowflake Thing because they're five teenage girls who have very, you know, sort of hardworking, well off parents. They have a huge house. They're lacking nothing. Their rooms are full of stuff. I mean, there's so much detail in the dressing of their rooms and the personalities of the five girls that you don't. I mean, I think you would need to actually sit and go through and pause the film to sit and look at all the visual information that you're given because they have fully fleshed personalities, each of the five of them. It's just we only see these minor glimpses because we're seeing it from the point of view of the boys. So we don't have access to that. And of course, it's their private worlds again. But it is there. It's all in the film. It's Mm. just we have to excavate it even more. And then it feels like even more of an invasion of privacy. You know, and the community seems to have collectively decided to not try to understand what happened, to just try and ignore it, to try and get on with their middle class lives. And this is set in tension with what's going on in Detroit with the car plants starting to fail. There's the picket that the funeral procession has to go through for the striking workers. And that was one of the moments in the film where I wrote down, is this going to have any consequence for the plot? And it seems... It doesn't. Because they were striking cemetery workers, it seems. So there's a backdrop of the working classes are not having a fun time and all these better off people have the ability to ignore the fact that five teenagers top themselves. It's painted very much as that's part actually of the pain. It's part of the painful legacy that this guy one of the four boys who tries to help them as an adult he's looking back to that time and it's part of his frustration and his pain is that the community, all their parents, everybody just moves on really easily and ignores it as if they didn't exist, as if they're ghosts already so there's the sense that the parents the Lisbons are ostracised after that they just go and nobody knows what happens to them. There's a very small sense, there's just implication of post-industrial Detroit emerging here and there's serious trouble and yet in the voiceover he refers to him and his group of friends as all being businessmen who circle around to each other every now and again and so they're still not attached to that world that the impact of economic crises, things that were affecting the working classes, it's still has never affected them. There's probably a lot to tease out about masculinity and crisis in this film because there's all these attempts to understand the girls and to get girls' attention, to look at girls, to feel girls, to touch them, to be in their presence, to have them look at you. That on the part of the teenagers and then the keeping of these very masculine jobs. So the car factory operatives and the cemetery workers. They're still coded as male 
male masculine jobs. There was that and then another reference again I was like I don't know if this is trite or it's too obvious but the reading of a 13 year old girl's diary just screamed of Anne Frank and then I wondered is that too trite? Am I the one being trite in bringing that association or is it the film? Because a lot of the stuff in the diary, as you mentioned earlier, it's quite mundane stuff mm. and it's a 13-year-old girl moaning about things that aren't a big deal. At dinner. And stretching it out, yeah. yeah. And there are parts in Anne Frank's diary where she is doing things like that. She's talking about getting her period and she's talking about being annoyed at her mum and finding her mum torturous because of what they have to eat and that they don't understand each other because she was a 13 year old girl Mm. that's what happens at that age so I did wonder that and then these boys all sitting around dissecting it and I remember reading Anne Frank's diary in school having to dissect it as a piece of literature and that's kind of what Cecilia becomes when they read her diary that they've pulled out of the trash I think Oh, so many throwaway details. I think one of them refers to finding its stuff behind a pipe at the uh-huh. school. Cecilia seems to be the one who delivers the key to why this has all happened, which she delivers it before the opening title mm. in a line which is part of a conversation that abruptly cuts off. Although it is a line which is included in the trailer, so it seems to be conspicuous as far as Coppola's concerned. And it's where she says to the doctor who's treating her after she has attempted to kill herself by cutting her wrists, the doctor says, what could you possibly have to be despairing about? And he says, clearly you've never been a 13-year-old girl. There's one clear statement there that there is something specific about experience of being an early teenager, particularly being an early teenage girl, which in general is just not acknowledged and in that time and in that place at any time in any place but there is a moment going on in this film it's within living memory of the summer of love and the headiness of the 1960s sexual freedom feminism and then they're in this what appears to be incredibly restrictive environment where they're not really allowed to mix with boys they don't even mention possibly again because of the point of view of the narrative there's no reference to them having girlfriends as well the sisters kind of group together even though they're all a year apart in five successive years there's just this stranglehold on them from an an overprotective mother who basically suffocates them what I'm blind to is that I've just been teaching an entire module about a lurch to the right in US culture that happened in roughly the mid to late 1970s. Mm. Of course that's what this film is about. It's It's reacting to what had come before. That was too wild and free, now we have to get back to sort of 1950s ideals. I suppose one of the things where the narrator, as far as the film was concerned, the narrator was that they were getting Mm. it right. It was when the four girls well, they went out with their mum to buy dresses for the homecoming Mm. dance and then the narrator says that each of them, the mum changed all the dresses so as to add a few inches to the chest and the waist of each of them so that when the four girls appeared on the night they were wearing virtually identical sacks. This another one of those instances where the costume as part of production design in general is quite clearly going, these people are dressing as if they're early Victorians mm. and that clearly indicates that as far as the film's concerned there was this lurch to the right mm. in the middle of the 1970s. Yeah, when they actually get to the dance all the other girls look very similar. They're all yeah. in those buttoned up dresses. And these flouncy, frumpy looking things. And dresses that go to the ankle, Mm -hmm. not kind of halfway down the lower leg, to the ankle. So that there's no flesh on display at all. And I suppose this is why when the girls do make any contact with the boys, they make a kind of desperate, fumbling, breathless sexual attack because they've been utterly restricted from being part of this so far. And it's but it's the younger ones because it's Lux becomes the youngest when Cecilia dies. She's 14 and she's the one who is most sexually aggressive. The other ones aren't really. They seem to have come through all of that before and that's how it is and they can't really be bothered getting shouted at and that sort of thing. I mean they actually think that you know when they realise that she's not coming when they have to go home and meet their curfew one of them says Lux is going to get it we're going to be fine and none of them are. They all get it. They're all housebound. One of the reasons I had to go back to the beginning of the film and check who was what age because I thought I'd noticed wrong what age Kirsten Dunn's character Lux was supposed to be. I thought okay she's got to be old 
older than 14, but no, 14. And perhaps she turns 15 during the drama of the film so that when she has that night on the football field when it seems that she's having sex, perhaps she's 15, but that's still basically too young. On this subject, why is it called The Virgin Suicides? I remember trailers from the period in which there was a voiceover which was a news report with someone announcing that the old thing about these suicides was that all of the girls involved were virgins. As if young people killing themselves would normally not be virgins and therefore there would be really unusual for any one young person killing themselves to be a virgin. Or did I just dream this? It's almost a kind of tabloid headline thing, isn't it? The film is punctuated with the news reporter trying to get a yeah. sensationalist story out of one girl's death she uses that to do a whole series of reports on an epidemic of teen a completely imagined epidemic and then there's that cacophony of news reports when the four girls kill themselves much later on in the film mm-hmm. so there's a mounting of people praying like you say it's a cacophony you can't even make one out because there's so many playing at the same time they've all been layered over each other so it becomes kind of white noise you can't even hear it anymore I do wonder is the titling of the book deliberately emulating the voice of the press at the time of the media at the time in that whether these girls were or were not virgins is something that narrator doesn't care about and that an objective view- viewer at the time wouldn't care about, but it's something only the media cares about. It's another way of robbing them of their sexuality. It denies them, it decides for them, it imposes an identity on them. They're virginal, they're like yeah. the Virgin Mary, they're obviously good girls and something's got to them. I did wonder for a moment, hang on, is this an ironic title? Because Lux appears to have some sex. Quite a bit, yeah. And, yeah. Is it deliberately an incorrect title because at least one of them isn't a virgin? Or has she been quite deliberately ha- only very nearly having penetrative sex and therefore strictly, yeah. according to a strict definition of sex, still counting as a virgin? Mm-hmm. The film is ambiguous on that. But they have sexuality, yeah. and Lux especially, from very early on and in Cecilia's diaries, has a rampant sexuality. The older ones, there's not a lot of it, but you can see that they have desire they want the boys to call them they want to kiss the boys they don't seem to be particularly bothered by the specific boy they're hungry for male company it robs them I think and again it's that imposition and if they're dead and gone and can't tell their story and if they couldn't tell their story anyway because they were trapped away they were hidden away in a house and they weren't allowed out and they had all these stringent rules around dating when was their mother even going to let them date I mean, the eldest one was 17. There's a denial, there's a, this continued denial that they have sexuality. So that's what I would say so is I suppose going the on with the title. The title of both the film and the book is supposed to be the voice of an agent in the story space who doesn't get it. It's either that or it's ironic because I think it goes a few ways. I think it's that denial of them, but also it's that tabloid reduction that is reductive of what has actually Mm. happened and of the nature of the people that it involves. It's just a snappy way of putting it, isn't it? Virgin suicides. So, all right, so obviously this is kids who've killed themselves then. That's the indicator. And because we associate the word virgin with Virgin Mary... There's something about them being teenage girls automatically. So it's a kind of shorthand way of getting to that. It denies them their sexuality sort of at once. It's pretty overt and it's probably ironic as well. I had always wondered if the title was played straight, what it could be suggesting about these girls. Like as if not having seen the film, was the title suggesting that these girls who killed themselves were people who everyone thought had been having sex and then turned out to not have been having sex? And I suppose in the case of one character, that might have been true, but it's nowhere near that simple. Teen films. While we're on the fact that this is about kids who basically span the teenage years, so 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, that's clearly announced at the outset. In teen films, at least since the 1980s, and quite likely going all the way back to the 1950s, the common trope is that the teens have the consciousness of adults. So they have the world weariness, they have the sense of emotional maturity, they have knowledge about their peers 
and about social interaction that means that they basically have the consciousness of adults. This is in part one of the reasons why in teen films the teenagers are often played by people in their mid-twenties. In this instance, at least, we do actually seem to have the characters being played by people who are the age that their characters are. But still, the characters seem to have a very mature consciousness. Amongst the boys, for example, or at least as far as the voiceover recalling what it was like to be those boys at the time, those boys have a kind of world-weary understanding of what's going on around them. Although some of their actions are naive, their determination to help the girls is that of grown-ups. Although I suppose there are those moments when suddenly they're just faced with serious stuff happening. There's two moments when it happens, and the first is when a bunch of boys have been invited to a party at the Lisbon house, and that's the party during which Cecilia throws herself out the window, and that's when she succeeds in killing herself. And I think it (coughs) needs to be mentioned that she's impaled on the railings, and that, again, just to bring it back momentarily to the sexuality thing, impalement is, of course, metaphorical for penetration, and also then it gives the men otherwise redundant men of the community it gives them something to do by removing the railings it almost gives their masculinity a purpose and that purpose is to shut down that transgressiveness of a girl having the autonomy to end her life in the way that she wants to and when she wants to i suppose in those instances when those boys they just turn it back into kids So I suppose my, doesn't this film give adult consciousness to teenagers thing? It definitely doesn't at these moments of crisis because we definitely get a, they're nowhere near emotionally mature enough to handle Mm -hmm. this. I suppose what they are confronted with on both occasions is people dying. But then I also wonder, would any adult have the emotional maturity to deal with it any more maturely than the way that they deal with it? Because in both instances they just leave. They leave in quite a bit of shock and there's not actually a lot they can do to have to walk away from this site of intense trauma. And if you were an adult who was a guest at somebody else's house mm. and then you witnessed this thing happening... Mm. Well, you'd stick around. Why do they just leave without saying anything? Uh-huh. Well, I suppose they do that because that's what they think that their adults they around them expect yeah. them to do. Yeah, just... it's a difficult one. But then, of course, it's a memory that we're seeing. What if it's actually the performativity of the memory is they just remember that and then they leave? You know, it's almost dreamlike in how it happens. Like, they just quite quietly walk off when it's Cecilia and it's a horrific sight because it's in darkness she's got the white dress on she almost looks like she's floating in the garden I think the way that that shot is framed is framed so there's a lot of out of focus stuff in the Mm -hmm. foreground so it's not at all clear what she's lying on before we get that shot we have quite a significant delay of people seeing Uh characters looking into off screen space and seeing that awful sound in the off screen space so lots of indications before we actually see it as well there's, a there's just more intensity. moments of horror on people's faces when the sound comes and they hear it and you see them working out what could have made that noise and then the horror the sickening horror of it and that moment of pause because they physically can't for a moment they have to steal themselves to go and have to look at it well, the film does not pull any punches for sure and it's interesting as well how it's so calculated and it couldn't be any thing else but the priest sanitizes her death he refuses to call it what it is and calls it an accident so she's recorded forever in the register as accidental death I was for a moment going to go do we have enough elements of an anti-religious message in this film to conclude that that's the main object of criticism for this film but actually yeah we do we have ample elements there's of some this. but I, I think as well it's not specifically you know I think you can go there absolutely with with um, criticism of such an intense practice of Catholicism but I think also it's a part of that general denial of the girls experiences mm. it keeps coming back to that early line that's also in the trailer that Cecilia says to the doctor you don't know what it's like to be a 13 year old girl the sheer intensity of what that's like and it's constantly denied the experience of being a teenage girl is constantly denied I think that one aspect of it being an adaptation is that it's quite episodic and there are a lot of characters there's the character with Down Syndrome who we meet in one scene and Joe. he's just a temporary member of the gaggle of boys mm-hmm. he's there when Cecilia kills herself and then we just never see him again yeah. and the same thing happens with the priest which seems Father Mooney isn't it? The one who says I've basically instigated this lie about how mm. Cecilia died. There's a 
character we meet for one scene and that's it. Mm. So a kind of a surface of characters is a quite a literary thing because when you've got a lot of characters in a book, there is rereading possible mm. words. In a film, that's less yeah. possible. And he serves quite a big function, though. I mean, he goes upstairs and the sisters are all in one room. You just see him looking into the room. I think it's only from behind. I don't. I can't remember, actually. I don't think he ever... They're never in the same mm. shot, mm. certainly. It's really just him talking at them. They're not having any of it, really. I think they're just yeah. lying there. And he says, you know, if you want to talk to me, I'm here. If you want to talk to anybody about anything, you know, I'm here. And he, a priest and an old man is the last person mm. they want to be around. I think with the boys as well, especially when they're all around at the house, Mr. Lisbon is in his element because I think it's fair to say that he probably wanted a son at some point. And he's yeah. kind of okay with boys and it's sort of all put on the mother that she's not happy about them being around boys. She's not happy about them going in cars because it's dangerous. She seems to be super paranoid and super conservative. And Mr. Lisbon seems to be fine with the girls starting to date because then he gets sons to play with and to show off all this crap that he they're not interested in because all they care about is girls. He's into planes, isn't mm-hmm. he? And he just wants to share that with with anyone. So it's clear that there's a void in his life because he's never been able to pass on his quite innocent boyish interests. Mm. So he hasn't been able to share that with anyone. He's got girls and they're coded as girls. And it seems like there's been no opportunity for any of them to be interested in any of that stuff. And I doubt it would be allowed even if they were. So that's a part of their lives you actually don't know anything about. Is that because the parents are so essentialist about gender that there's no opportunity for the five girls that they have to be in any way fluid. To be interested in the things that their dad's interested in. Which out of fa- having five kids I really don't see. See that I did for a while think, is this film secretly quite pro either sex or gender normativity? And the reason I thought that was because of the scene with Chip Fontaine's two dads. So we get one scene in which here's a non-normative family. Mm-hmm. One of our characters is a son who has two fathers and there doesn't appear to be a mum around. So here's something non-normative. And yet those two dads are shown to be naive idiots. Now, it's not the case that the film's going, therefore all two dad families Mm. have naive idiots as the parents. But if that's the sample that it takes, there's at least an implication there that that's what the film is. I think, again, it's important to be specific. They're very well-meaning, and Mm. they seem to have a happy existence, and it's a really Mm. nice portrayal of that. But they're not best placed to... And they give him well-meaning, but not very good advice. It's kind of vapid, imprecise. This guy, Tripp, ends up being one of those cool guys who ends up being a train wreck because he seems to be in rehab when he's being interviewed as an adult. It's all very subtly done, but mm. it's, there's the payoff moments where it's made clear. Because it's on. regular appointments with Mary Jane as a way through school. It's probably likely it becomes an alcoholic or drug addict, and that seems to be the implication. And he's talking a lot about never getting over this girl that he abandoned, and he doesn't really know why he just left her alone. Yeah, if someone do explain stuff even yeah. from the older boy characters and everything. They don't even know themselves, never mind not knowing the girls. There's a kind of strain of utter selfishness in so many of the characters that shapes a lot of the events. For a film which leaves an intense taste in the mouth but quite an unpleasant taste in the mouth, it's very good at showing characters being awkward mm. in addition to being selfish. The performances that Coppola's got out of her actors mm. are lots of awkward body movements, lots of fidgeting, lots of shifty eyes, lots of shots being held while characters glance around and generally look uncomfortable. It's not just a trope of teen films that teens kind of they move a bit differently from adults, they're kind of constantly squirming. It's a way of indicating that even the adults are really uncomfortable in their own skin. This is a world where nothing quite fits. People mm. aren't in the right shaped hole. Even those tiny details about how people move, alongside the whole massive detail that we get in the set dressing, it does make for a very strong taste in your mouth afterwards, even though that strong taste is hardly sweet. You've got to admire how well crafted it is. I think it's framed in an interesting way because it's retrospective. You know very early on that they're all going to die. <laughs> So it's just a matter of how we're going to get there. It was a surprise the way they got there because what we were Mm. getting at the point when the four surviving sisters all killed themselves in one night Mm. was something like a rebellion with the four boys actually helping 
I thought that that set of shots, which was the four boys and the four girls in a car driving yes, during the daytime, yeah, um, I thought it was real, but no, it was an imagined Same imagining shot. imagining what was yeah. going to happen. Like part of a, a set of different types of subjective shot that you can do in film that I think need to be studied with a monograph that you and I need to start writing tomorrow. <laughs> because I've got a student who's writing about subjective scenes where these are daydreams. They're imagined scenes that definitely don't occur sometimes that they have supernatural events occur in them, so it's made very clear that these aren't actually happening in the realist story space. They're always bookended by a character looking into off-screen space and getting a bit distracted, and then at the end mm. someone's often going, hello, hello, so clearly it's a daydream. And that's part of a whole menu of types of mm-hmm. scenes that are apparent by the end as being non-real, mm. that they're imagined in some way. That was, I suppose, is one of quite an extensive repertoire of ways that this mm-hmm. film said, do not trust yeah. what you are seeing, it's, it's- it's very mature for a first feature to draw attention that much to its subjectivity and yeah. remind you that you cannot trust what you see and <clears throat> hear in this film. This is something which we don't seem to get in Lost in Translation or The Big Guy Old. We do get yeah. uncertainty, not over, hey, we just lied to you. And I suppose, you know, there's lying and then there's lying. because It's a different you... narrative voice. Uh, right, yes. This is what I think is known as the bad faith narration by the film's own process? It's not really, but I wouldn't call it bad faith because in this again it's the subjective imaginings and remembered imaginings of this man who's narrating, who was a boy, who was one of those four boys, and you're seeing a shot of what he imagined was going to happen. I suppose what I mean by bad faith is if the film doesn't make it clear from the outset whether it's showing Mm -hmm. what a character is imagining was going to happen or something that actually did. In the film language, in this sequence of editing it's very natural this is the next day yeah. kind of shot and it tricks you yeah. yeah yeah and then you have an oh right okay he's just imagining that oh i see what's actually yeah. happening is horrific the horrificness is emphasized with contrasts in color saturation uh-huh. and color palette and the amount of light there's the fragmentation of the girls bodies as well, you just yeah. see the feet, you just see the arm. I wonder whether there was a deliberate attempt there to go, with four of them killing themselves at the same time, we're not going to do the same thing that we did when we showed you Cecilia having uh-huh. just killed herself because we showed you her entire body there. And you don't see Therese at all. At all. You're yeah. just told that it's sleeping pills with her. So we see Bonnie's feet and we see Mary's, Mary's feet. feet. Yeah. And then Lux's, Lux's arm. arm. Yeah. But it still has the cigarette <clears> in, the ha- in the finger. Hang out of the car. We've noticed a few times in films the past few days that the normality of smoking is something that says this was shot in or this is set in the past because we're just now so accustomed to people not smoking indoors. <laughs> if, if people are smoking, they're doing it outside and they're miserable. Something I was noting down early on, thinking about the Blue Isles and the, the film as a precursor to it, is the girls obviously bursting with sexuality that's being repressed and they're yeah. being closed in in this big house. But also the pastel shades of the dresses. The first time you see them as a collector, you're the first party, I think, in the basement. And of course, the party has to be in the basement, has to be pushed down and hidden away where they can't be seen through windows from the outside. But I was wondering, so the girls are all dressed up in their best dresses because there's this heterosocial event happening to try and fix Cecilia because she's around too much girl company. That's what the psychologists like by Johnny DeVito was suggested and so they throw this party so they're in their finery kind of like the beguiles when they have dinner with John isn't it? It could be worth comparing the shots from the party in The Virgin Suicides with maybe the first dinner in The Beguiles because I wonder if there's any coding to the colours because there's a sort of light blue, there's an off white, there's a pinkish peachy colour, you know that kind of thing and do they correspond to a character type? Can you identify by that across the different sets of girls. If there's one director who we could have a reasonable degree of confidence would use that precise degree of colour coding, it would be Sophia Coppola. Mm. Yes, I'll look into it. So that could be something useful to if your student is working on that. It could be something mm. to suggest. Absolutely, yeah. 
I have one word left in my notes that we haven't, at least to some degree, covered so far, and that word is vinyl. And this film burning. loves vinyl. Mm. The thing when they're four boys and four mm. girls are playing records to each other over the phone, so they're communicating using their collection of 45s. That was a, one of those moments of quite fond nostalgia, where in many other regards, these films are saying, this was quite a putrid 1975, but at least in one aspect of popular culture, I suppose specifically the aspect which is the one associated with teenagers at the mm. time it's being in touch with popular music the film is pro that aspect of the 70s and the film's coming out at the time when you're starting to see the death of the mixtape because you're moving into cds and stuff and mm. nobody's using cassettes as much anymore and they're starting to die off but nostalgia for older technology there's multiple attitudes towards the past in this film because mm. that loving account of their use of vinyl seems to be an objective narrator who's just telling you something about what's great about being a teenager in the mid 1970s whereas that's the narrator that seems to be not allowed to operate in this film because the whole process of the film seems to be that it has to all be through the eyes of the boys so it's one of those not permitted glimpses as far as the film's main principle goes but it seems to be an indulgence that Coppola permitted herself. What did you think of the use of Morse code? And again, I suppose thinking about old media and old modes of communication. Mm. When I was a teenage boy, CB radios were the, hey, here's an interesting technology that we can use to get in touch with an interesting world out there. And that was in about 1984, 1985-ish. The use of lights to tap out Morse code to boys who live over the street seem to be keyed into that whole roster of aspects of teenagers interacting with the world in ways that are different from adults that you get in teen films and that affinity between teenagers and any technology as long as it's not the technology used by parents even if that means going back in time and using flint to light fires and <laughs> projecting images on the walls using magic lanterns and so on. But again, I was going to say described through an objective, inverted commas, narrator, but actually that's the that stuff with the Morse code lights, that's all shown through relatively point of view sets of shots from mm. four boys. To add to the discussion on narration, there is a moment where I think it's after when you see the parents leave there's Mrs. Lisbon's voice is what you hear. Her voice comes through and she's saying um, her girls have no lack of love. The boy is adult. He's gone back to saying we're trying to figure out the sequence of events. We still can't agree on it. We can't evidence anything. We have no idea what really happened who died first and what really went on, what part did we play in it, that sort of thing. And then there's a part where the mother's voice comes in. She's saying they had no lack of love. Is there an implication there that that was the problem? They had too much overbearing love, too much controlling love? I, my reading of that bit was that the mother was just mistaken about what constitutes love. I think that the mother was thinking that giving them unconditional stuff was the same thing as giving them unconditional love. But what she was actually doing with her parenting was refusing to even acknowledge mm. their basic personhood. One of them, even, it's probably Lux, I think, but it happens off camera. It yells at her, you're suffocating me. I need to leave this house. And then there's moments where in the school, one of the other teachers says to Mr. Lisbon, you, you girls haven't been in school for two weeks. What's going on? And he's mumbling at the plants. He's yeah. maddening. He's starting to go mad. That was something that was quite subtly done and mm. also quite challenging as well because it just went, hey, this character has got a mental illness mm -hmm. and we're not going to have dramatic music playing at the time we're just going to have other characters have going oh that's a different way of behaving from the way we're used to people behaving and the line he gives when he responds to the question where are your daughters he says have you checked out the bag like they're objects that might have been left yeah lying around um, outside the building Maybe a word on casting, because we mentioned that a little bit we were watching. So we talked a little bit about Kirsten Dunst there earlier, and this is her in a transition period between child actor and adult actor. It's possible this is what could be considered as her first adult role, even though it's a teen role, but it's a very adult role as well in many ways. She's playing the most transgressive character, the character with seemingly the most autonomy, to the point where, in a way, her character Lux leads to the downfall of her and her three remaining sisters, but then that's blaming the victim on the imprisonment of all of them in the house by the hands of the mother, it seems, from the story that we're told. 
but we mentioned a little bit about Kathleen Turner playing yeah. Mrs. Lisbon. And Kathleen Turner being most recognisable from her role as Joan Wilder in Romancing the Stone and Jewel of the Nile, in both of which she's plucky, rule-breaking, and a bit of a sexual agent as well. This is, seems to be a casting against type mm-hmm. for Kathleen Turner. This is someone who wears polo necks with a cross over them and always has her hair tied back mm-hmm. and is always insisting that her daughters have everything to fear mm-hmm. about the outside world. You can derive meaning by casting against type. You can say, just look how unwelcome the baggage that you associate with this actress or actor is in this film. Look how conspicuously different this character is from what you've seen in this performer play before. I went on Kirsten Dunst, born in April 1982. So when doing this film, so let's say it was shot in late 1998, early 99, Mm -hmm. she's 16, 17, playing a 14, 15 year old. So close. It's not getting someone in their mid 20s to play a teenager. No, it works, and she has to do a lot of kissing of boys and lots of fumbling and things like that. So it's quite fascinating the way she sort of seems to invite random boys and somehow get them to go to the roof of their house and the other boys the boys trying to help them are across the road watching through telescope and fighting over the telescope the same way they were fighting over Cecilia's diary because they're trying to understand they're trying to help these girls they care about them and they're worried about them being trapped but also they kind of just want a copper fail and get a glimpse and mm. get titillation from the images of these girls. And it's mostly through that one boy at the school refers to her as the hottest girl in school. She's the one that trip the guy who all the girls are dying about. She's the one he's dying about. It's all centred around her. And that's quite a big character for such a young woman to carry. But she's well versed at this point. Mm. She's kind of already a veteran actress. She knows what she's doing. She's the one who tries the weed. And the other two are not protesting because of what it is. But protesting because it'll be smelt off her. And Mm. she'll be in hell for it. Cecilia wrote about her writing the names of boys that she liked in her underwear and the mum bleaching it out and then the, the night of the dance there's a kind of little uh, what do we call it? Yeah. what do you call that? there's uh, a kind of it's like a reveal a little well, cheeky reveal because it's technically a super imposition isn't yeah. it? but it looks like it's x-ray vision looking at the word trip written on her on a very on her um, underwear. girly looking underwear mm-hmm. For somebody who seems to be aiming to go out to have some sex that night, she's wearing yeah, very girly underwear. But you don't have much choice if your mother's yeah. going clothes shopping with you, as is seen in the sequence where they go to the thrift store for the dresses. Yeah. And it's really nice actually seeing that brief shot of the four girls and the mother in the thrift store a couple of weeks after seeing Lady Bird, where one of the pivotal scenes in that film is... Christine Lady Bird going to the thrift store with her mother and them having a big argument and then bonding over the dress yeah. to wear to prom. That was interesting in the two different ways of dealing with, again, that girlhood experience of going clothes shopping with your mother for you know, a fancy dress because you're going to a dance or an event. There was moments when we seemed to be getting, and this may have been more of this narration not through the eyes of the boys aspect of the film, there seems to be moments when we were actually getting genuine bonding between the girls and their mum when things were okay. Maybe even that was imagined by Mm. the voice, just not clearly articulated to have been imagined by the voice. It seems that there's a lack of control and is it the ultimate transgression, the ultimate protest, when all you've got left is the body you occupy? Is that the ultimate protest? Is that the ultimate teenage rebellion to take your own life and to leave the body? The body's littered around as debris and they're scattered strategically all over the house the garage the basement the bedroom was one of them in the kitchen wasn't it they said Mary whose legs were on the floor they said she put her head in the oven and I I suppose the protest element of killing yourself it's not an alternative reading of the act of killing yourself to it's something that's very brave because it's your way out of suffering it's just a complementary way of reading it in some cases it can be your way out of suffering in other cases it's both your way out of suffering and a way of protest that thing that is causing your suffering. The fact that all five of these girls have killed themselves means that as far as the mum is concerned,
concerned, none of them can go to heaven. And there's no mention of that whatsoever. The fact that the priest has falsified some documents doesn't mean that any divine overseer will be fooled. And so I would have thought that that's something that would have been very clearly shown to us as having traumatised the mum, but she actually seems quite stony-faced about the entire thing. Like She doesn't really believe in any of the supernatural stuff. She just wants to exercise the control over her own daughters that was probably exercised over her when she was young. So she's just passing it on. And I do wonder if the act of suicide, at least as far as the girls are concerned, having been brought up by a Catholic mum, whether the act of killing themselves would be a protest theologically, mm. a way of going, you want us to behave in such a way that we'll make it into the right afterlife, we'll screw you, we're going to do something now that will automatically mean that we don't, if you happen to be right. I'm um, not going to go where you want me to go. It's constant resistance. The normal thing seems to be that amongst mainstream and also semi-independent Hollywood filmmakers, that anti-religious stances tend to be very implicit and very quiet. My classic example is, and you're going to hate me for this, a bit in Titanic, where our two main characters late in the sinking and they stop at another character who's a priest reading one of the psalms out to a bunch of characters who are kneeling around him, and then they just move on. The attitude there is that our protagonists go, mm. OK, we know some people do that, but that doesn't do anything for us. OK, thanks. And then you can get slightly more critical stances, mm-hmm. such as the one we get here. Mm-hmm. And the one that we saw in Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri, where one of the main characters just tells a priest to fuck off. That was probably the well, one point part of that film that I could really get behind. And it was the fuck off which cited child molestation mm-hmm. as well, specifically against well, the Catholic. It was priest. a rant about culpability, which I think mm. is pointed at the moment. You can apply it to a range of things. The film would have been made long before the Harvey Weinstein thing and all the movements that have followed from that have emerged. If you're culpable, you know, if you're associated or even if you're a bystander, if you've ignored something that's gone on and you still Mm. associate with this particular thing, you're culpable, you are responsible. So it's a stark reminder. Even a film like this is if you perpetuate that kind of repressive atmosphere and uh, repressed behaviours and the overbearing concern with safety to the point where you're, you're blind to the fact that you're killing the people you're trying to save all the time because you're preventing them from living their life so if you're going to prevent them that much well then they're just going to stop the existence that you're forcing on them. You're culpable and so it's important then that you get that moment of the mother on the voiceover basically absolving herself and yeah. not dealing yeah. with why they've done it. I suppose she doesn't absorb herself by saying, no I did it, I'm sorry. Day. It's not a confession. No, it's absolution. not. It's, it's just, a, I didn't do anything wrong. All I did was love yeah. them. The sort of attitude that comes out in what she says is they were not in lack of love, I think is the way that she puts it. And that's the problem. It's because you can say that, but the extreme situation is there's too much. There's too much of the wrong sort of love. And it suffocated them. And like you're saying, it's a misunderstanding of what love is. I suppose it comes up with Trip a little bit as well, because he has, seems to have a misunderstanding of what love is. You know, he talks about having never felt that way about anyone other than Lux, and yet he treats her abysmally. There's misguided ideas about love bubbling along in this film. Mr Lisbon, he's the bystander who can't really... He doesn't or he can't or he's paralysed in some way. He is ineffective. His masculinity is ineffective. He's Mm. basically destroyed by this house of women. I suppose when he starts to become a bit detached from the world, such that he's talking to plants and doesn't really seem to be communicating with people, Cecilia has killed herself, of course, by that point. But the main trauma at that point is that the four girls have been basically locked in the house by their mum. That's the thing that's really traumatising him. So he seems at points to be the character who may be the real loving parent who Mm. may be able to raise them in a way that's respectful to them and he's the one who's just being overborne Mm. by the mum. Yeah, because he tries. He wants his daughters to date and spend time with boys and for that to be normal. He wants his kids to be happy when Trip, Josh Hartnett's character, goes to see him to try and convince him to let him take 
like Lux to the dance. He makes the point of saying, you know, it's my wife, really, who is restrictive about this. He makes a half, you're know, joking, not joking comment about how it's really her. She won't let the girls date. She won't let them go out and she's very strict about that. And because they've done it to the older ones, they can't then just allow Lux to start dating. And James Woods doing that scene, he's got wonderfully shifty eyes when he's doing any acting. So I suppose that means if you ever wanted him to just be a very honest, <laughs> upright, I don't have anything to hide, I'm not lying to myself character, you'd have to really get him to not be constantly moving his eyes. Because <laughs> that's his default setting, the constantly moving well. eyes. Do we have any summarising thoughts? Because this is our third Sophia Coppola film that we've watched mm-hmm. inside of about a fortnight. There was a line in there in the voiceover, the imprisonment of being a girl. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's an idea, an image that reverberates throughout. I'm guessing that's going to be relevant in Marie Antoinette as well. I don't know about the bling ring, possibly. I don't really know anything about the other film. I hadn't heard of it before. Definitely in the three that we've seen, I think that line applies. The imprisonment of being a girl absolutely implies in The Beguiled. I would say it applies to Charlotte in Lost in Translation because she's a young woman being played by someone who is between girlhood and womanhood who's really a girl slash woman quite lost in a very strange place emotionally mentally physically open mind for a moment perhaps this is all about the first world problems of white women Mm -hmm. who have quite a lot of money but I suppose if you're saying even first world Mm -hmm. sorry and they're mostly blonde yeah so if Sophia Coppola's going even relatively wealthy relatively privileged first world white women nonetheless are experiencing gender as a removal of agency there's clearly something wrong Mm -hmm. with gender Mm -hmm. as a whole. Mm -hmm. So rather than it being, hey, poor us too, there's can be seen as something, saying something in general about girlness, about what about gender. One thing, the last couple of feature film you were thinking of was called Somewhere. One thing we do have that seems to be a theme across all three of the couple of films we've watched in the past couple of weeks is that nobody is entirely innocent morally. Everyone makes a mistake of some kind or another. There's mistakes and then there's deliberate transgression, I think. There's different degrees of people being at fault. And, of course, in some cases, the mistakes that people make they make just because they're too young and uninformed about their surroundings, so they're hardly culpable for having made that mistake. But that seems to be one of the major themes of Coppola's output. As we've so far watched it, it's that there are no unflawed protagonists anywhere. Maybe we'll get one... We're not going to get one in Marie Antoinette, are we? <laughs> what am I saying? Stylistically, static cameras, expressive use of colour, performers being permitted to communicate through rather small bodily gestures in rather long duration mm-hmm. shots. These things seem to be quite strong, consistent aspects of how she makes me. It was interesting how they don't refer to house rules, they refer to policy. The parents, that's not our policy, it's political. Oh, yeah. It politicises the space, the domestic space, I think. And that overtly links their house with the politics of government at the mm-hmm. time. So it's the lurch to the right in... Yeah, that's not um, our policy. The resurgence of the Republican Party mm-hmm. at this time. If you were going to do an adaptation of a version of suicide and your first draft of the film imagine you draft a film you don't draft a screenplay you just make the entire film <laughs> that's your first draft and you're going to have a go at changing it and you can shoot completely new scenes would you change anything significantly? Josh Hartnett's hair <laughs> there's that detail where when they're crowned homecoming king and queen mm-hmm. that Lux gets the crown put on her head but then the teacher tries to put it onto Tripp's head and Tripp just grabs it and waves it around Mm. because he doesn't want it to go anywhere near his hair. Was the film going, he's been brought up by two dads? Is that effeminate hair what you get when you're brought up by two dads? You know, was that an element of... Is he overcompensating with all the girls that he flirts with? Was the film making mild, at least, implicit comments on same-sex parenting? Possibly. I do think it is worth pointing out that high-angle shot of him in the swimming pool and he's just lounging around on a lilo just shades of the graduate I saw shades of the graduate in that green tinted party scene after the final suicides where Mm -hmm. there's a pool at the back and everyone's wearing way too formal clothing Uh for a party in somebody's house absolutely and then one of the characters just jovially throws himself in the pool and and no one laughs at the joke that Uh he's just made I'm a teenager Um, life's too much for me I've had enough splash there was something a bit reminiscent about the plastics Benjamin, you've got to get into plastics. 
that was just the setup of mm-hmm. people looking out over a pool behind a house where there's yeah. a lots of people who are too rich for their own good yeah, um, around it. Yeah, wrapped up in themselves. Seem to be quite the graduate. Although, rather ironically, that character who delivers the line, the plastics line in The Graduate, I really want that jacket. Everything else about him is, of course, vile, but he's got a really nice jacket on. So, references galore. It knows where it's come from but I suppose on that because then in the new Hollywood it's that angry young man and it's the transgression of the younger men characters who are not played by men of their age mm-hmm. and in this it's the teen girl played by teen girls mm-hmm. and the very specific transgressions of the teen girl and that all just leave me alone taken to its ultimate conclusion we weren't wrong in thinking when we went into this that there would be a lot of stuff about girlhood in these films Mm -hmm. this is going to continue this isn't to say that dominant themes in your work makes you predictable or pedestrian or anything something which we associate with even the most unpredictable and the most mm. inventive well, um, producers. ways of working through something because there are reasons why what many would refer to as auteur directors, you know, distinctive filmmakers. There's a reason why they keep coming back to the same themes and issues is because they're still working through them. It's unfinished business. Coppola, as far as we can tell from her body of work so far, she has unfinished business in this area she is not done in dealing with the possibilities of girlhood and it's a specific kind of girlhood it is white middle class girlhood but that's what she knows and who is she to talk for anybody else all you can hope is that her having that platform she could be the sort of influential person in years to come who can pull up other people behind her and open those doors for inclusion for now as is has always been the way with feminism I think as well is it's the most privileged go first and even the most privileged have problems and pressures Mm. so I think we're getting a fuller picture of what we're in for when we move on to the other films we're into that hypothetical position of if someone was to plonk four films in front of us and one of them is Sophia Coppola's newest film and yet we've not shown the credits for any of these films it's just Four films minus credit. We should be able to figure out which one of these four films is Sophia Coppola's newest film. That's the theory. Mm -hmm. How you could ever actually carry out that experiment, it's another (laughs) matter. But I think there's patterns that we have observed that we would be capable of recognising, I think. Whether those patterns definitely don't exist in the work of other filmmakers is a further question. But I'm game for flushing out our knowledge of this matter. Here end of the list. been listening to audiovisual cultures with me paula blair and andrew sheil this episode was recorded and edited by paula blair and the music is common ground by airtone licensed under creative commons attribution 3.0 and available for download from ccmixter.org if you like the show and find its contents useful and interesting please help cover production and distribution costs by donating to paypal.me forward slash pea blair and liberapay.com forward slash pea E.A. Blair. Episodes are released every other Wednesday. Please rate, share and subscribe on your chosen listening platform as this helps others find the show. For more information visit audiovisualcultures.wordpress.com and follow AV Cultures on Twitter and Facebook. Thanks for listening and catch you next time.